In today's lesson, I'm going to look at globalization and the impact it has on our sense of place and the way we feel and perceive places. Um, it's part of the OCR A-Level Spec 2.A, and I've highlighted the section there that it, it relates to. The quick definition of globalization um, to base us around is talking about how the world is becoming more interconnected and more intertwined across many different areas. So economically, uh, socially, politically and culturally. We're going to come back and look at those in a bit more detail later. The idea I want to focus on at start is about the global village. This is the idea that the earth, you know, has stayed exactly the same um, size. The places between them haven't changed any um, physical distance, but relatively um, we could say that the actual world is smaller because we're more connected. So the idea that America is still as far away as it always has been, but we're actually more connected to America than we were maybe 200 years ago, 50 years ago. This is kind of related to the idea of time-space compression. So it basically says the idea that the relative distance between places is getting smaller and that's because of processes that have made that smaller. So I've got the example of the, of the Atlantic here. That physical distance the Atlantic hasn't really changed. However, if I look at Columbus, he took f nearly 40 days to cross it when the technology was that of, of sailing ships. When we got to steamships with the Titanic, that was 80 hours. When we invented planes, we could get across it in 33 hours. And, you know, with satellite technology, we can go around the whole world, let alone the Atlantic, you know, a couple of times in five hours. So what this tells me is that technology has actually made places seem much closer than they actually were before. And that's because it takes less time. The physical distance hasn't changed, but the relative distance in terms of travel time or cost has changed. And that goes all the way back to when we were on just horse and cart that would obviously affect how far places away seemed and how much time it took. And now we're at the age of kind of airports um, and planes and satellites that will affect how far away places seem to us and therefore how we feel um, and, the, and the level of connectedness we can feel with places. Here just shows the example of the, that intertwined and interconnectedness. This is the flight paths um, across just a section of the world. It shows you all the little dots of the airports and those are the flight paths. This shows you that globalisation uh, and that interconnectedness is a really, uh, really complex pattern. Um, and, and it's something that has increased. This wouldn't have looked the same if I went back into the 1960s. So it kind of it's, we're in an era where it's accelerating. I talked about technology changing. Um, it's not just in terms of our transport, but also our telecommunications. So, you know, there was a time where this type of phone would have been one of the most advanced bits of technology we have. But now we've gone to mobile technology. And that's even before we start on the fact of the kind of growth of computers. These all kind of make sure that, that our societies are way more connected than they were 50, 60 years ago. We can um, distribute capital and information at uh, the, the speed of light almost. And um, that means that we can communicate much more easier and, you know, on a bigger scale than we ever could before. Here's just a, another example showing those huge kind of cable links that we have between countries. This doesn't even take into account satellites, but it shows you that, again, that complexity of uh, communications between places. I also want to talk about the idea of the fact is technology makes us seem closer in terms of how quickly we get information, but also the type of information we might change. So... You'll be like very familiar with these social media outlets, um, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. I want to talk about in the context of the Arab Springs. This was some anti-government protests that happened in places like Egypt and Tunisia uh, and in 2010s. Uh, also happened in a couple of other countries in, in the kind of Middle East. But the, these um, social media, these are so these are kind of... Um, Kind of technology that is on a global scale. These are used by people on a worldwide scale. They were used by protesters to actually 
organise the protest. So they they communicated people and they got people to um, kind of share ideas and protest. But also on a wider scale, actually, the kind of reports that were coming out of the of the bad things that the government were doing in places like Egypt and the actual footage of the protests that could be shared to a global audience that could share, be shared to kind of people in the West. Um, and therefore, ideas can be quickly exchanged and also kind of pro the profile of these kind of uh, incidents could be pro promoted from just like a regional level to a global level. So we can say that technology and social media can seem places that might seem kind of completely distant or far away from us actually seem closer, not just in terms of um, kind of the uh, how we can actually get to them, but also how we we share information with them, maybe the kind of um, social and political connections we can have with those places. However, this process of globalization and time, space and compression, it does come with kind of some issues. So if you go into most high streets and most towns in the UK, you, you'll see that kind of lots of the global brands. I've given some examples here. Um, these are brands because of globalization. They can um, be in multiple countries. They're huge transnational corporations. But we need to think about how that might affect our place. If I go into any town and there's a Starbucks, for some people it could give a self of security, but it could also mean that the uniqueness of that place kind of is lost a bit. Places feel like clones, a bit like the women in this picture, kind of they all look and feel the same. And therefore we kind of might lose what kind of makes a place unique. I've given an example here of kind of free um, shopping centres or malls. They could be pretty much anywhere in the world. They are from actual different parts in the world. But it's this idea that we have these sometimes clone towns where these huge global brands, chain stores, dominate our high streets. And we lose maybe those local independent businesses or ones that are specific to local areas. You can actually, as part of fieldwork research, look at this and, and study to see if globalisation has had an impact on the kind of local businesses of an area. This isn't just in terms of our physical environment we can see these changes and the fact that time and spatial compression can have a negative impact. But actually, with, with more interconnectedness, sometimes we have now, in recent years, seen an actual retreat back into kind of more older um, place-based anacities, and more localism, more nationalism. And I've given some examples here. Donald Trump very much cutting America off from the part of the world to make America great again. Uh, you know, the act of building a wall that's kind of prevents Mexicans from coming in is a real sign that he's trying to reduce those connections with other places. Leaving the EU, the UK leaving the EU in the term of Brexit, that is very much trying to kind of um, remove ourselves from that global network, at least on a regional scale, uh, and, and showing that we kind of want to be kind of more of a local nationalised. The last example I've given is Catalonia. Again, this is where um, kind of territorial integrity and sovereignty is overruling that willingness to become globalised and interconnected with other places. It's kind of return to the local, return to the national. The last kind of area I want to discuss in this is talking about time, space, compression and globalisation actually doesn't affect everyone equally. There are winners and losers. Here's an example of the, the city of Detroit, but it could work for many places. Detroit is a, is a famous uh, town that was built on car manufacturing and secondary industry. But unfortunately, with globalisation, uh, lots of that industry went to places um, it, Emerging, emerging and developing countries due to the fact that they could do it for cheaper and there's tax breaks in those countries and the labour costs are cheaper. This has obviously, this globalisation has had an effect on Detroit because now we have lots of derelict secondary buildings, there's been out-migration, crime, unemployment, poverty. And so the local sense of place are kind of connected to these now. A place that was a, a, a booming place kind of in the 60s and, and 70s, is now a place of crime and unemployment. So the, the globalisation has meant that people in Detroit are actually the losers of it. You could argue that people in the EDCs are the winners because they've got jobs and the, the opportunity to make money, but there are winners and losers. And again, I've, I've pointed to another example of this to say, you know, there might be people who are extremely wealthy in the world who can go on super yachts and private jets 
they might think of the world as a global village because they have the resources to be able to have holidays in, in, uh, and second homes in different countries. They'll be able to have the, the money to access all those transport and technology to feel connected. Where if you're someone without the resources, um, you know, for example, a refugee trying to move from another uh, a country, a conflict zone to another country, you might feel like this isn't a global village and there are actual barriers that stop you from being able to feel connected um, to not only um, the rest of the world, but also to your own places. So we can find that globalization can actually um, make the places that we know well, uh, us feel resentment to them or even kind of um, a lack of engagement with places that we used to know.